Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where I meet interesting maritime professionals, sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gosberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast listeners. Welcome to the 88th episode of the Shipping Podcast. Just imagine, there is almost 88 hours of listening to do. 88 different people who I have been speaking to with the Shipping Podcast. I feel humble and grateful that you are downloading and listening, but also to my guests. I usually fall in love with the last one of my guests, always. And this is not any exception from that. Finally, I'm going to talk about something that I know a lot about. If you don't know anything about my background, I used to be a marine insurance broker and then a marine hull underwriter. So I have done approximately 20 years within the marine insurance business. And now I got to interview some marine insurance people. In March, I went to Piraeus in Greece. And I visited the offices of the Swedish club. And I met with Stelios Magcanaris. He is a marine claims adjuster, which means that he deals with marine claims. Stelios is also a fellow of the Association of Average Adjusters. So what is an average adjuster? Well, they are experts in the law and practice of general average and marine insurance, who prepare claims under the policies, the marine insurance policies. Stelios will tell you a little bit more about his background, so I won't go into details. Stelios and I sat down on March the 15th, 2018, in Piraeus. And this is our chat. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Thank you for inviting me. My name is Stelios Maganaris, a qualified average adjuster adjuster as well as uh, a mechanical and marine engineer. I'm working for the Swedish club uh, in Piraeus. I've been in the business for many years. It must be around 25 years now. And I've been working with the Swedish club for the last 18 years. So what is your background? What is your education? My education is uh, I started in the Marine Engineers Academy sailing with ships, attending ships during repairs. And then uh, I went to the university for the uh, bachelor's or honors degrees and the postgraduate diploma, the master's degrees. After that, I was uh, involved with the new building constructions, plan approval, contract negotiations, the supervision of the new buildings, mainly container ships, 13 container ships in Korea. Uh, I also attended them as uh, superintendent engineers afterwards on behalf of the ship owner. And uh, the next step was being involved in the insurance industry. And then it was when I joined the Swedish club as staff surveyor, then technical manager. Then I took over the handling of the marine claims in the Piraeus office. And uh, for the last five years, I'm doing the uh, adjustments of casualties, of course. The life in the insurance business, of course, is with uh, casualties. Small casualties, big casualties, and even huge catastrophes. Why did you choose the career in maritime when you started? How did that come Uh about? I was born in a shipping family. So ever since I was baby, I was uh, baby. I was um, listening to my father talking about propellers, about pistons, about collisions, about uh, ships all the time. So you understand that this was more or less. It it is fascinating, of course, working and living in the shipping industry. So it was a one-way street, you may say. Do you have any siblings? No, no? I do not have any siblings. I'm an only son. So it was not a family thing that everyone (laughs) had to. (laughs) There was not a family push, but uh, I'll give you a a small example. When I was little, I thought that uh, the whole world was about like shipping, that people were waking in the middle of the night over a phone call about a ship with a problem in the mid-Atlantic or that uh, it was Christmas, uh, Easter or weekends. And of course, 
with a phone call, you had to pack your bag and go to the other side of the world trying to solve a problem. I thought that this was the normal way until I started realizing that uh, the rest of the world was not like that. So when you have been brought this way, leaving the troubles as well as the fascination of shipping, it's, it's difficult to detach. So for people who do not work in the marine insurance industry, so what, what does a loss adjuster do? What is your role in the entire chain? <laughs> Right. I better start the other way around in order to answer your question. I will give you the perspective of an engineer to the average adjusting profession. When I was uh, working in the club, in the insurance industry, as a surveyor, going on board ships with disasters, with some catastrophes, broken metal, all that we can all imagine about a casualty involving several members of several interests, for example, it looked strange to me how the lawyers and the average adjusters were looking at technical facts and technical opinions and uh, uh, issues that uh, were straightforward for us. They were not uh, uh, received the same way from the average adjuster. So something that it was reasonable for me technically it was questionable for the adjuster. So I thought, why there's this difference of uh, approach? Then I started searching further. I came across the average adjusters of the Swedish club at that time, Fritz of Granberg, who used also to be an engineer, and uh, uh, Ingrid Andersson. And uh, I, I started being attracted by the way that they were approaching the casualty through the rules. Then I started uh, studying the rules, clauses, acts, and uh, it, it was like opening a new window for me, looking at the same issues, same technical matters, same casualties, but with a completely different set of eyes. I was given the opportunity to attend courses in, uh, in England, which fascinated me even more. And uh, then I decided, that was uh, 2011, I decided to follow the footpath of this profession to the highest qualification, which is the Fellowship of the Association of Average Adjusters, which I attended in 2017, last year. Interesting. It's interesting, I think. What are the biggest changes that you have seen within the maritime industry through your career? There are changes in many dimensions, but I am trying to think now which are the most, the most important ones, the most grave ones. Back in the 90s, 80s and 90s, the maritime industry used to be a very closed cluster. The people that were involved in this industry were professionals from several professions. There were lawyers, captains, engineers, brokers, uh, underwriters, but they, they had a standard way of uh, thinking, a standard way of working. With the introduction of modern technology, things changed completely. It was not only the speed of doing the same job, but at a far greater speed, it was also that other expertise were introduced, such as, especially, computers, IT technology. The, the vessels became more computer dependent, which is not always a good thing. This opened up the industry to a lot more expertise, professions, we may say, more dimensions. This is good but it has its dark side as well. That the more people are, the more people who are not accustomed to the way shipping works uh, are getting into this, uh, this group, the more alienated they became. So one side does not exactly understand what the other side is doing. In the past, a chartering broker had a very good idea about what a ship is how it will trade, what were, not in great detail, as much as a captain or an engineer, but 
had a very good, very reliable idea what was the object with which he was working with. Now, if you go and ask somebody who is uh, an IT expert about a vessel for which he is uh, handling the everyday communication of the vessel, or uh, the computers on board, or the software, or the ECDIS, for example, this person may not have a clue what a ship is. Does it have engines? Does it, uh, when does it sail? Uh, what are, it, are its needs? So you see that, yes, they are now included within the shipping family, but they are not well, they are not knowledgeable about, uh, about the shipping matters. So who is teaching them? Or no one is teaching them that? I don't think that there is any teaching. Okay. I can give you an example. Uh, lately, I, we were discussing about cyber, cyber, uh, um, cyber dangers, cyber attacks on board ships. And I discovered, to my disappointment, that many people that talk about cyber, IT people, technology people, they talk about cyber attacks on board ships. But when I ask them, right, tell me, how can you physically harm the ship? They could not answer it. This means that you have a lack of knowledge between what is a computer on board the ship and how it can, how it interacts with the machinery, with the navigation equipment, with all that, in order to appreciate the dangers. Going back to your previous question, this is what fascinated me with the insurance industry that. I covered not only the technical aspects of shipping, but with the average adjusting, you can see the far bigger picture of the, all the, interest, in the interests involved in the maritime adventure, both the ship owners, the, uh, the charters, the cargo, the underwriters, the P&I clubs, the, um, the port authorities. Okay, yeah, yeah, I understand. But being, being in insurance, it's like you are carrying the risks of the owner of the ship. This is true. The ones that the ship owner has decided he does not want to carry himself on his books. This is partially, partially true. Okay. The, the, sometimes there are misconceptions. Sometimes people think uh, the, that uh, if I am insured, I do not have to worry about anything. Whatever happens to me in my, uh, in my account, I only have to pay the deductible and everything else is insured. This is absolutely wrong. Somebody is insured for specific risks, specific losses within a specific period under specific conditions. There is no such thing as an open-ended insurance. There cannot be an open, open insurance because the underwriter or, what, or whatever insurer cannot quantify the risk. This is sometimes difficult to explain it, especially to ship owners. It's difficult to explain it. They have this concept that I am insured. Whatever happens, the deductible will be my loss. Yeah, I recognize that. <laughs> <laughs> but have you seen any statistical changes in the kinds of claims lately? Or has that has any impact, uh, the technology developments on ships? Do you see? What I'm thinking about is like the environmental aspect that the shipping industry is going through right now, where we are getting new uh, regulations about fuel and uh, that will have an impact also on the machinery and if they are installing scrubbers because they want to uh, obey to the new rules 2020 that there should be less sulfur emissions from the ships. There are certainly the legislation ashore influences immensely shipping. One of them is what you just mentioned about the uh, uh, the emissions control, which is a huge issue. Here I come to something I said before. It's also the main problem is miscommunication because the, uh, the, the governments are legislating 
some measures, some limits or some whatever, how can I describe them, necessary operations, modes of operation that probably cannot reflect into the technical reality of ships. One of them, for example, I, I will tell you how this legislation has revolutionized the machinery on board ship. One of the main reasons to install uh, an electronic controlled engines, what we call the camshaftless engines, which came into around 2004, 2005, came to be installed on board ships, new ships, of course, was the flexibility that these engines have in order to adopt to the combustion of the engine, the operation of the engine into different operating uh, modes of operation when the ship is uh, at the port or going through a second area. This equipment, which is far more complicated than what it used before, has also created a gap in the ability of the crew on board to respond to technical problems, to a failure of the machinery with the new engines compared to what it used to be before. So with the older engines, the crew on board has had a far better grasp of the uh, technology that they had in their hands and they could they could do something, they could fix a problem on board. But when you have an engine which is mainly controlled by computers, there's not much that the engine crew can do when this thing fails. So you see that the legislation created a need to which the shipping industry did respond, but of course created far more complexities and the result is yet to be seen. The, as far as the, the casualties that we observe, these are, these are highly dependent in the chartering market out there in the seas. We had a very high frequency of casualties back in 2008, 2009, 2010, which has nowadays dropped immensely. Ships are going slower. We do, however, have different kind of failures because the ships are going slower now. Uh, one other uh, aspect of shipping that I saw which is also related to, to the casualties is the what I, I like this definition very much because I was told about this in a, in a conference uh, by a Swede is that the crew is considered a commodity. It wasn't what the crew used to be 20 or 30 years or even before that, where the ship owner and uh, the ship manager, they knew very well, at least the officers that were going on board, but also the crew, the rest of the crew. Now, with the, with the shipping being in such, um, with so many ships uh, and the volumes that are out there in the seas, this link, this affiliation between the crew and the ship manager has been almost lost. We, I am in Piraeus and still here we still have to a very great extent family shipping companies. To a very great extent this affiliation is not felt so much, which means that the, the people that are on board the ship are um, have been with the ship manager, with the ship owner for years. And this uh, connection, this link still holds pretty well. However, if the ship managers are going to more corporate structures, more faceless structures, then the crew on board will become also a commodity, a faceless commodity, which probably will not be able to, um, to respond to the needs of the sea. The sea is brutal, the sea is savage, always has been and will always be. So how do you see the future of shipping then? The future in shipping in terms of as a profession you mean? Yeah, and I think about autonomous ships, I think about the technical developments, the innovations. Mm, I am more, I'm pretty traditional with shipping. 
Uh, the autonomous ships may sound uh, fascinating for somebody outside shipping, but for anyone who talks about autonomous ships, I would invite him to cross uh, the Atlantic in the winter or come in the Bay of Biscay in the winter, be on board a ship, go through uh, uh, Beaufort uh, 9, 10, 11 and see what the sea really is. And then let's start talking about autonomous ships. Maybe that is why they want autonomous ships, because they don't want to be on board <laughs> in that condition. This is true. This is true. Yes. Yes, this is true. But uh, the people that uh, a ship is not an Xbox device. We don't want Xbox crews. We want hands-on crews. Not necessarily that they will, they will do something, will drive away the technology from the ships. But when something fails, you want to have the ears, the eyes, and the expertise on board to fix something. Let's not forget that something very simple may be rectified by the crew on board and save, first of all, lives. Second, many millions of dollars which are on board the vessels. But what about the digitalization? We touched upon it when you were talking about the cyber security. But still, I mean, there are more and more machine to machine connections, which is sort of digitalized on board and then sent on to shore and uh, analyzed and so on. How do you see that in the maritime industry? This will definitely increase. The, the digitalization will certainly increase, but there has to be on board the ships. I believe that the systems that you have on board the ships are two. One is control of the machinery, and the other one is alarm and monitoring. In the past, you used to be isolated, and I believe also now, although I've been away from, uh, I haven't been on board the ship for six, seven years now. In times of emergency, you could very well isolate the alarm and monitoring and you can take over the control of the ship. And the ship was seaworthy, absolutely seaworthy, could continue the voyage without any problem whatsoever. As long as these two functions can remain independent, there is no problem at all. You can transmit all the data you want from on board the ship to anywhere you want in the world, to the ship manager's office, to an engine expert or whatever, that's not a problem. The problem will happen when you will, take to, you will want to take over the control of the machinery, the control of the ship. Then it may be a problem because you will not be able to respond in times of emergency. The, the ship has been designed in order to respond to the needs of the sea. You have to experience what the sea is, the risks of being there, the risk of something failing, in order to appreciate what kind of backups should I have, what kind of measures should I install so that if everything fails, then I will still survive on board. This should be the driving mode. In order to have a grasp of what it is being on board a ship, being responsible for this, and also having your life on board, you have to go out in the sea. So uh, we are often talking about shipping amongst each other. So we are a close community still, even if we are starting to talk about the cool things that we are doing outside our own circles. But, but how could we become more visible to the general public, do you think? The, the problem, shipping, as we said, is an extremely traditional industry. And this is wrong. You should be traditional for your needs. You should make changes when needed, not because it is fashionable. But on the other side, you should be able to approach people outside shipping. Make yourself known, make your needs known, advertise your successes, also advertise your concerns because you failed on something. This way you will become more approachable. In the news, shipping is addressed only when a casualty happens, which is wrong. Nobody 
can uh, appreciate the effort that is put on board some very highly advanced vessels in order to bring, for example, energy, to, to bring uh, natural gas, petroleum products from one side of the globe to the other, which are, of course, enjoyed by the people ashore, but they do not know what kind of efforts have been made in order to bring them at their doorstep safely without affecting the environment, without harming the environment. So this is something that, yes, shipping people are struggling to do, but it is not advertised. It is not made known. It, 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 the reason that you make it known is not in order to take uh, just pride about it or uh, appraise yourself. No. The reason to make note is that the people will appreciate the products, the commodities, the services that they come at their doorsteps, what kind of effort has been made in order to bring them at their doorsteps. And also at the price that they pay, which is far less than if they were going by planes, of course. But how do we do that? How do we become more visible, all of us? This is a responsibility of the people in shipping. The, the way, uh, for example, one way is what you're doing here with uh, the podcast. It is, I wouldn't say, first of all, pure advertisement does not pay off. It's not like showing yourself. If you invite people, come around and see how a port works. Go on board the ship and meet the people, talk to them. Go for a, a school excursion, for example, on, go, on board a ship. Go for a school excursion at a shipyard, at a repair yard. Look what these people do. Sometimes you accuse them, I believe wrongly, for the majority of the people in shipping, that they neglect the environment. Come and look how many measures have been taken, how many precautions have been taken. If you have anything to, uh, uh, to recommend, you are more than welcome. But approach the community, approach the society, and come on board to see what the, this really is. Yes, I agree. I think that's the only way forward to, to, for us to start talking about our industry to other people. And also to show young people that we are a cool industry because we are going to compete with every other industry for the brightest minds that should help us develop our community for the future. Absolutely. Uh, and if they don't know about us, how will they find us? Exactly. We exactly. can't lose them all to the IT industry. <laughs> <laughs> Someone has got to do something more interesting. It's not only the IT industry. In order to be, I think, in order to be involved in the shipping industry, you have to have a, a, an, an adventurous element within you. As I said in the beginning, uh, you have to be prepared. We're talking about the core business. You have to be prepared that uh, this is not only a nine to five job. It, it is not uh, something scheduled. So if you're uh, interested in a little bit of adventure, then that's the door you need to open. And also to meet interesting people. Because you never meet a dull person absolutely. in the shipping industry. Absolutely, absolutely. You are absolutely right. Don't forget that it's such an international business. At the same time, it is like a small village. People from the one side of the globe know very well they have worked, they have struggled, they have sweat on board ships for casualties, for uh, constructions, for repairs, from the other side of the globe. I am not aware of any other industry that creates such environment, such international environment, but also at the same time, such closeness of people. Uh, you have, uh, in a casualty, you have uh, hours and hours of phone calls with a surveyor, with a correspondent, with a lawyer from Argentina to the US, to Hong Kong and to Peru. And with these people, you will not just exchange messages, send me th three packets of this or five. You will, you will share the anxiety, the, the stress, the passion to fix things as they happen. So it has the element of a lot of adventure. Who do you think I should meet the next time? Who would you be interested in listening to in a podcast? Oh, uh, you mean the shipping industry? Yeah. You got me by surprise. I haven't thought of this. 
Or do you, who do you think people should listen to? Who, I, who could tell a good story? I think that I will tell you uh, the reverse way. I will tell you from which people they have. I have heard uh, very interesting stories. We used to have a salvage master at the Swedish club. And uh, when I joined the Swedish club, uh, I was getting a custom of what salvage is, what is general leverage. And I used to read his reports about salvage, salvage operations in Parana River or in Nigeria. And I was amazed. This was a kind of an Indiana Jones story. So I believe that these people, they do have very interesting stories to say, fascinating stories. So somebody from the salvage industry will certainly have to say fascinating stories. Okay. I will try and find someone who could tell what they are doing in their everyday job as well. Thank you very much for Thank being you, a guest on the Shipping Podcast. Stelios made me think back to the time when I was working within the marine insurance industry. That is an exciting job, which I've left behind me now. But to be an underwriter, you need to know so much about the ship owner that you are going to insure. You need to know their strategy for maintenance, for crewing, what flag they are flying, where they are going, what they are carrying, and so on. You need to know their financial situation if you can find that out. And maybe you know who are lending them money. Then you need to know what kind of ship is this, how has it performed until now, and what kind of claims have they been suffering. Before you know all of that, you can't make yourself a picture of what you are going to insure and how much that will cost. So being an underwriter within the maritime industry, that is knowing a lot. A lot about the industry as such but also about the ship owners and the ships that you have in your portfolio. So as a marine insurance underwriter, but also as a broker, you know a lot about a lot. People do not really realize that. Usually when I attended parties or dinners with my friends and they would ask me, what do you do? Well, I work within the insurance industry. Everyone thought that that was the same as insuring your car or your house or something like that. It's not. You need to know so much more. And you need to know that the person that you are insuring with will be there when there is a claim. When something bad happens. So it's all about trust. And I think maybe that is where I got my bug. And there are so many things you need to know when you are working within the shipping industry, which people doesn't really think about. So when I was in Piraeus, I managed to meet another insurance person who I will be interviewing in the next episode. So I will leave you with that and say from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to the Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a Shipping Podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry. 